You're watching Word Alive Bible Study at Word Tabernacle Church. I need a word, life life changing word. A place of relevant ministry where relationships are built, needs are met, purpose is fulfilled, and God is enjoyed. Join us now as we get stronger, grow deeper, and go higher. Stronger, deeper, and higher every day. Ephesians chapter number five, Ephesians chapter five. Um, go ahead and turn with me. It's going to be some heavy, heavy stuff I'm going to be talking about here. Um, but I hope it'll be impactful. I hope it'll be helpful. I hope it'll be strengthening for our lives. And, and so Paul starts here. If you notice the pericope of your Bible in Ephesians five, Paul talks about walking in love, walking in love. Um, He's really gives us an indication, a hint about where he's going because he opens up chapter 5, verse 1 with the word therefore, which takes us back to chapter 4 and what our life ought look like, what our conduct ought look like as a result of what he's already shared. And then he says, if you need someone to imitate, if you need someone to give you inspiration, he says, just do what God does. Just Watch what God does in Jesus. Be that person. Even before I say something by way of introduction, let me just say this to us. Would you spend some time this week reflecting on who do you imitate? Or let me say it another way. Who gives you inspiration? Right? Who, who makes you say, man, I want to do that. I want to try that. I want to I wanna experience that. And let me say the opposite. In addition to that, not only do I want to encourage us to, to be able to address who, who, who is inspiring me, who am I trying to imitate, but I want you to also reflect on who's watching me that they can imitate what I do. Who's watching me that I give them inspiration? And I think if we, you know, we we're, we're, we got to be careful, man, because we are all mirrors, right? We, it's easy. We, who am I reflecting in my conduct? That's what Paul is teaching us today. That's what I want to teach, reflections in my conduct. And if you remember, let me make, let me, let's, read, let's read the verses, and then, and then we'll, we'll, we'll just un, unpack this. Um, Ephesians 5, and then let's just even begin at verse 1. Ephesians 5, verse 1, Therefore, be imitators of God, right? Let him inspire you. Be an imitator of God as beloved children. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is, an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon us, the, comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners, some Bibles say partakers, with them. For at one time you were dark, you were darkness, but now you are light in the world. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. Try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. And therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Amen. Now, th this is tricky stuff. It's tricky stuff because let me give you this first statement of introduction. The first thing I want us to be mindful of is we are set apart from the world so that we might be sent into the world. 
Now, this is a very important concept. You remember when Jesus is praying in John 17. When Jesus is praying in John 17 and he prays his high priestly prayer, he begins praying. He says, they, they are not of the world. Do you remember that? He literally says, they are not of the world. Just, he says, because I'm not of the world. And so he says, take them out of the world, God. Keep them from evil. They're not of the world, just like I'm not of the world. Sanctify them by truth. Then he says, as you sent me, so I send them. So it's weird because what God is really saying, and this is what Paul is saying, Paul is like, you can't reach people if all you do is act like them. He says, you can't influence people if they don't see any difference between them and you. You, you can't possibly encourage me about my financial situation and you broke. Like, you can't fix what's wrong with me when I identify the same ailment with you. So he's saying, you have to remember, we are in Ephesus to reach people. He says, but the challenge is we, we have not taken a moment to be set apart from them so we can go back into it. And I think it's something that we have to be mindful of even as Christians. They, like, God will remove us from certain places, right? And so oftentimes we're so glad to be gone that it never dawns on us that maybe I'm supposed to go back. And, 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 and this is what I mean. So, like, if, I'm, if I've been a victim of domestic violence and, and God has saved me, then I, according to this scripture, God is like, I, I set you apart from that so you can be an influencer in that. See, what we do is we want, so, so like, let me tell you who should be volunteering at, you know, uh, pregnancy uh, uh, crisis center or uh, the care center. People who had abortions, people who struggled with it, you know, the people who should be volunteering at places of domestic violence, people that should be working with human trafficking, people that were prostitutes. You know, we, we should be, the, the one who should be working on health issues is the person who has gone through cancer, gone through hypertension or diabetes. See, what we do is we try to distance ourselves from all of that, and God is like, no, I set you apart so I can send you into it and be an influencer. So keep that in mind as we walk through this. The second big thing I want to say, I only have three points of introduction, and then I want to share two major big points. The second point of introduction is that our conduct should clearly reflect our place as God's people. I'm going to have parents that's going to type amen or say amen. Let me, let me illustrate it. The point is our conduct should reflect our place as God's people. Parents, help me. For your child and my child, their conduct should reflect their place as my child. Amen. That makes sense, right? So. How many times have we said to our children, you are not acting like my child? Or how many times have we said to our children, I don't care what his mama let him do. That's not his, you, I'm not his mama. I'm not her mom, his daddy. I'm yours. Right? This is what God is saying. Your conduct should reflect the fact that you're my people. That, that, it's one thing to be in Ephesus not know God. It's one thing to be in Rocky Mount, Nash County, Edgecombe County, Wilson County, Wake County. It's one thing to live in Hereford County and not know God. It's another thing to live in Pitt County, know God, and act like I don't know God. And this is what he's saying. So my conduct has to reflect my place as God's people. Remember, they're in a culture where they, they really idolized sexual immorality. And because of that, God's people came out of that environment. They came out of that environment, and they're still operating in that environment even though they profess Christ, which takes me to my last point of introduction, and then I'm going to give you the first big principle. The last point of introduction is my present, y'all going to like this. I like it if you don't. My present life should reflect my ultimate destiny. <laughs> this, is, this is a major, major point here. My present life should reflect my ultimate destiny. Now, you're saying, well, pastor, where is that? If you notice, he begins referencing the kingdom of God. It, go, go to verse 5 with me real quick. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, or that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom. Whoa, whoa wait a minute, wait a minute. No inheritance in the kingdom. That, that's a reflection. I'm going to talk in detail about this in a minute. 
That's a reflection ultimately on the consummation and the fulfillment of Christ's reign on the earth. That's the, my ultimate destiny. This is what he's saying. You're not living like where you say you want to go. Your, your behaviors, your habits don't reflect. Let me, where are my young people? Um, um, you don't act like you want to go to college. You, you don't study like you want a scholarship. You, you, don't, you, don't, you don't practice enough at night to act like you want to get a, a sports scholarship. He's saying you, 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 you don't really, you got a new boyfriend every week, you really don't act like you want a husband. He's saying how much you really don't want, you spend frivolously, you really don't want financial breakthrough. How many of us, if we were to look upon our lives, that the way I'm living today does not reflect where I claim I want to go? And this is what God is saying that we've got to be able to brace and understand. So as he begins walking through this, he's like, oh, you want to be a part of the kingdom? Act like it. Oh, can I, can I go ahead and teach it? You want to be a leader? Act like it. You want a title? Act like it. You want people to trust you and follow you? Act like it. You want to have good integrity and character? Act like it. Too many times we want something and then our behaviors don't match it. And this is what he's saying. This is the moment where I reflect on my conduct because my present life should reflect my ultimate destiny. Real quick, real quick, real quick, just a free moment for relationships. That's why the Bible says, he who finds a wife. Think about it for a moment. Not he who finds a girlfriend. Not he who finds a single woman. He who finds someone who is acting today like what she wants to be. <sighs> my present life should reflect my ultimate destiny. Now, with all that as a backdrop, let me give you some principles to think about. I'm going to drop words on you today, and then we'll talk about them as we go. Um, um, number one, I want you to write down the word standards. Type in the word standards. The first thing that Paul begins to lay out is he begins to lay out our standards. He says in verse 3, have some standards. <laughs> Sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. And this is interesting. Paul says, let me, let, me, let me take this walk to the lowest common denominator. There are some things that ought not be associated with believing people. Now, it's interesting what he does here, because what he does is he talks about things that we don't really equate as together. He talks about uh, sexual immorality, but then he talks about covetousness, covetousness, greed. A, you know, one of the things that I'm going to be teaching on in great detail in 2022. It's hard for me to believe that's where we are, y'all. We're right there. We are right there. Um, I'm going to be talking about generosity, right, n next year. And, and because God is like, people who love me are people that don't allow certain behaviors to dominate their life. They don't allow, it's not characteristic of my people. Now, now, the first thing he does is he says, when he starts weighing up the standard, he says, we have to have a standard where we look at how we love. So type down the word love, jot in the word love. So the first standard is about how we love. He gives us two standards. The first standard is in how we love. And what he does is in verses one through four, if you'll allow me to walk through this with you, in verses one through four, as he lays out the standard of love, Paul says, I, wanna, I want you to have an example to reproduce, right? That's the first standard of how we love. The way I love you is an example that I get in God, in Christ, that I need to reproduce. So he says, look at it. He says, be an imitator of God. That's the example to reproduce. Walk in love. That's the standard. My love is the standard. The same way Christ, he says it again, loved us. And then he says, but sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among the saints. Verse 4, let there be. And then he talks about our mouth. Wow. 
See, I, I, can I say something I love about God? He, he puts equal weight of sins beneath the waist as above the waist. I love that about God because, see, we don't. We, we are, you know, we, we got a high, we have our preferences. You know, it look, don't matter that I'm gossiping and cussing you out, at least I ain't sleeping around. And we have our standard like, hey, you know what? I'm better than you because I don't do, because I sin in a different location of my body. <laughs> that's if we were to be honest, if y'all would really be honest, that's how we act. We have our preferences, right? God is like, no, the standard I want you to reproduce is one of holiness above and beneath the waist. Amen, Pastor Galea. So he begins talking about, let's talk about the way he talks about him in the scriptures. He said, the example I want you to reproduce, let's talk about beneath your waist. He says, so sexual immorality, um, we would call that fornication. Um, he, would, he would say, abstain from that. Don't, don't do that. He said, that should not be named among you. He says, impurity, or what we would call uncleanliness, right? Incest, um, sodomy, you know, things like that. And then he says, covetedness. Like, and this is not an exhaustive list. He's just highlighting, hope we can be honest. He, it, it's, it's almost like the billboard top six of sins. He's like, let me hit the highlights for you so you understand what we're really dealing with here. He says, and then he gets into the issues of above my waist, really even above my, my shoulders. He says, filthiness, um, no filthiness, no foolish talk. You know, I'm learning, man. You know, I'm just, I, I just don't have, I don't have time and energy to engage foolishness. I just want to encourage us. Can I just encourage us, encourage those who are watching? You, you, I just want to encourage you to stop trying to convince a fool. I just want to encourage you to stop trying to argue with a fool. It's some stuff, you know, it, like I'm really struggling even. Like I'm, I'm really struggling. Like I've been posting stuff about critical race theory. And then, you know, I got, I, the more I think about that thing, I'm just like, you know what? It's going to take the Lord to fix the brain of a fool. It's like, I just don't have that kind of anointing. Like, I'm not anointed enough to help somebody stop being a fool. So I figured I might be better off spending my time and energy with somebody that can be influenced versus, so he says, all this foolish talking, you know, this buffoonery, this stupidity, this absurdity, this, you know, let me, let me, give, let me give you a way to say it. Ask yourself, is this even profitable? Is there any possibility that there will be benefit from this conversation? And if there's no possibility of profitability, then no, don't even do what he says. He says, foolish talk, crude joking. He even puts it in context. He says, which are out of place. How much stuff do we talk about that's just, we talked about things at the last Bible study, Bible study before that. How many times do we allow ourselves to have conversation that's just out of place? And, and I have to be careful that as a believer, I don't participate in dialogue that I know is out of place. You know, things that I know as a believer, that I'm not, I'm not inappropriately laughing at people or making crude jokes about people. Um, you know, that, and, and, and sometimes, man, I just have to guard my mind from that stuff, right? So I've got to be careful what I'm watching on television, what I'm listening, what songs I'm listening to. I mean, listen, I mean, real talk, can I, hope y'all can handle this. I know y'all going to think I'm nerdy and corny and I don't even know if we, I guess I'm aging myself, right? I don't even, even call people corny no more. I know you think I'm just not woke, whatever y'all want, how, whatever the expression is, right? There is nothing, in my opinion, for a believer that should be entertained by the lyrics of a song that, that are talking about molestation and abuse of women. There's nothing funny about that. There's nothing to dance to with that. There's nothing that should entertain us about that. And I'm not trying to be all deep and all that, y'all, but, 
you know, at the end of the day, we should not be entertained by that. Can I, that's not even in the discussion questions for our groups this week, but can I ask you to process that? Ask yourself, what is it that entertains me? Because we may find ourselves like, why am I entertained by people getting their head chopped off? Like, I've been, I've been processing my own deformity in that regard. You know, why am I entertained, you know, by certain things that I'm entertained by? So Paul is like, I want you different. So he says, the way I want you different is by the example of Christ that we reproduce. Because listen, we are his hands, we are his feet, right? We are being, re we are a reproductive body. And so our standard of love begins with this issue of reproduction as the example we have in Christ. That makes sense, right? Now here's the second thing about this standard of love. It's not just in the example of our reproduction, but secondly, it's in the evils that we renounce. Now this is really important because we do have people, let me give you time to jot that down, the evils that we renounce. Verses five through seven. The reason this matters is because we do have Christians that think their only responsibility is to live holy and are refusing to deal with the issues of injustice and inequity and wrong that they see around them. This is hard for us because we live in a society of bystander apathy. We live in a, a society where we're like, you know what, I, I can't really get into, I can't, that's not my business. Let me ask you a question. Do you think when God is viewing us from his throne in glory, do you think when he sees poor people sinned against, do you think God is saying up in heaven, that's not my business? Do you think when people are being forced into predatory lending that God is saying that, that that's not my business? Do you think when women are struggling to stay in a marriage and being beat by their husband, do you think God is on high saying that that's not my business? Of course not. Now let me tell you why this is gonna be convicting for us. Because the way he gets in that business is through us. So this is that issue of now the renouncement of evil that we see around us. You know, a lot of times we know people are wrong and we're just kind of like, look, I ain't, I ain't getting that. I ain't, that's none of my business. God is like, no, no, you represent me. When you represent me, you renounce evil. That's what we do. So look at verses five through seven real quick. Verses five through seven, he says, for you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or is covetous, um, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes out, the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become, uh-oh, y'all were waiting for that, right? Partners with them. When I'm around you and you've told a lie about someone and I said nothing, I've become your partner. We are partners with some mess. God is like, no, that's not how we function. So let me ask a question. This is another one for a small group, or a group study, a home study, kitchen table talk. Who are you partnering with? How many times do we see something, but we speak not on it? Right? So, so now this is important because what he's doing, this goes back to the statement I made an introduction to that. What he's doing is he's linking my future inheritance with my present conduct, right? So when he says in uh, verses, in verse six, let no one deceive you with empty words, I'm sorry, verse five, for you may be sure of this, everyone who is sexually immoral and impure, and I'm, don't worry, I'm coming for y'all, because I know some of y'all are like, I'm going to hell. I know, I know, I know, I know some of you not married, having sex, like, I'm going to hell. I know that, no, I know that's what, so I'm coming for you. Don't worry, I'm coming for you. So just hang in there. So I may be sure of this, everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance, and here it is, in the kingdom of Christ and God. He's saying the inheritance that I get in the future has got to be linked to my conduct in the current. Right? Um, let me say it like this. You, you can't get the insurance policy when you die 
if you didn't buy it when you were living. You got it? So he's saying, so what you want in the future, you've got to start living now. I'm going to say that one more time. What I want in the future, I have to start living now. Um, <laughs> if, if you want to retire at 70, you need to act like it at 30. <laughs> you, you need to act like it now. You got to act like it, right? He's saying, so, so you know, if, if you want to buy a house in three years, you need to act like it now. Right, so he's saying the conduct of today, now this is very important, because he's saying the kingdom of Christ and God. Now, we don't talk a lot. I, I did a little bit in the coffee chat about the kingdom. You're going to hear me talking about more about the kingdom. I may, be, I may do a sermon series in 2022 about the kingdom. The kingdom is both present and future. So remember that the ultimate reign of Christ on the earth is going to be that final act of completion or consummation. But I can't, so if, if we only view kingdom from the lens of completion, then it gets us off the hook for how I live today. Did y'all catch that? Um, because I can't expect something to complete that hasn't been started. So that means the kingdom of God is both present and future. So he's saying you want an inheritance in the future, but you haven't even gotten on a bandwagon in the present. And as a matter of fact, if you want an interesting study, pay attention to every time um, people come to Jesus. We're like, man, what are we going to do about the future? What we, what's going to happen at your second return? What about his life? Every time, Jesus is like, pump your brakes, just live right now. <laughs> just don't worry, about, don't worry about all that next month. Just do what you got to do right now. And, and, and so, and so y'all, the issue Here's the struggle now. I told you I was coming to get you because, because this is the evil of renouncement, right? So here's the issue. We are not, we still have issues of immorality as saved people. As saved people, we still have issues of impurity. As saved people, we still, ha we still have issues of idolatry. Why, why does the Bible say anybody who says he does not have sin is deceiving himself? So now this becomes the quandary of the text. Because, God, make up your mind. If, if you say, if I do it, I can't get the kingdom. But in another place, you say, I'm doing it. <laughs> and if I act like I'm not doing it, I'm deceiving myself. So, so God, what is it? This is what he's saying. He's saying that as a believer, if I am living a lifestyle of unrepentant and unconfessed sin, I'm in trouble. Got it? Yeah. So, 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 so this, is, this, is, this is where we get deliverance right now. So God is saying, and I want you to jot this down, type it into your notes, or to, I need to work on my confession. That that's what he's saying. As a believer, work on your confession. He's saying, because I want you to understand something. The reason he's telling them this is so they get it right. And I think too often times we operate in condemnation and judgment. And he's saying, man, look, don't kid yourself. Y'all running around doing what everybody else doing. This is what he's saying. And you're not even losing no sleep. Like, it don't even bother you. So this is what he's saying. I recognize you got challenges, but as a believer at the least, there ought to be some conviction that settles in that says, I got to stop doing that. Yeah. I, let, me, let me park here for a moment. Let me park here for a moment. Let, let, let me tell you, I told you you need to work on your confession. I need to work on my confession. Let, let's talk about how we do that. You know, because I mean, because remember, it's not just conduct. It's God is like, I know your thought life. Can I go ahead? And, I'm going to go ahead and say it. If, if you married and, and you watching a TV show or looking at a magazine and see somebody of opposite sex is really looking good, if you say, mm, if I wasn't married, you just sinned. <laughs> and, and so, so, so he's saying, I know your thoughts. I know. You know, when you you looking at, you know, married woman in the church and, and, and you like, shoo, man, if I wasn't married, 
or she wasn't married. He's saying this is, so you got stuff with you, he's saying. So in order to fix it, he says, I want you to learn how to work on your confession. Because if you work on your confession, you can get to a place of true repentance and you get that stuff behind you. So let me help us for a moment. Let me help us for a moment. I think the first thing we need to do, and this will work in any sin in our life. And I know I'm probably not getting a lot of love on social media right now, not getting a lot of love in studio, because we just don't want, we just want the preacher talking about how I'm gonna be blessed and you know, how it's my season, you know, and you know, I got victory, victory, victory. And God is like, yeah, but let's talk about your mess. Because maybe if we can get you to a place of confession, I can release some stuff for you. Maybe that's the issue, right? So how do we work on our confession? The first thing we do, we already did. The first thing, it's not in your notes, it's just pastor trying to lift up people. The first thing that I do to work on my confession is identify what the word says about what I'm doing. That's step one. Forget about, this is why, forget about what Ephesus is doing. Forget about what is happening at the temple of Diana. I'm using the historical context of, this, of sex. Forget about what's happening over there. Identify in the scripture what it is that I'm supposed to be doing. That's step one. So now my standard is weighed against the Bible and not society. So then that no longer can I say, well, everybody's doing it. Because my standard is not everybody, my standard is God. So step one is, you know, identify, you know, the issue, right? Identify what the Bible is saying. Now, here's the second thing. After I identify the promise or what the scripture says about an issue, and y'all, this can be for anything. This can be for my resources, my stewardship. I mean, you name it, right? What's the scripture say? Now, here's the second thing. Ask myself or process within myself what is it going to take for me to believe this? I'm, I don't know what y'all doing out there on, online, but I'm teaching good. I don't care what y'all say. I'm teaching good. So, because here's the deal. 100% of our sin, we know better. I've, told, I've said this many times in my 21 years of pastoring. I've yet to pastor any person in the church that were like, oh, that's a sin? I had no idea. <laughs> Everything we do, that's a sin we know. So here's the question. I need to ask myself, what is going on with me that I just don't think this do-do is stinking? What's going on with me? Because God has made it real clear. Why, what is happening with me? I'm not in denial. I know what it says. What is it going to take for me to believe this? That, that's the question I got to raise myself. In any area of my life, what is it going to take? God is like, who, what do I have to do to get you to believe this thing is real? So that's the second element in confession is, is identified that I'm asking myself, what, what do I need to do? Now, now, let me give you the third thing. The third thing that I need to do is I need to realize or recognize something. And what I need to recognize is I need to recognize that the natural is not more real than the spiritual. Whew. I, I, boy, I'm, I'm sensing. I, I wish I, we're going to need altar call. I'm going to have to open up church for altar call. I, we're going to have to tell y'all the doors are open. Y'all can just show up and just get laid down, prostrate before the Lord. This is, this is because this is what he's saying, y'all. He's saying... You don't see the kingdom. It's spiritual, right? It's, this is the intangible side of the kingdom. It's the consummation and completion of all things in Christ. That's ultimately more real than your temporary feel-good yesterday. He said, that, that's going to last longer. He says, so many of us just don't realize Spiritual or unseen stuff is more real than natural stuff. Okay, okay, y'all. 
they acting like they're not getting it. So let me try to take a step back and say it like this. It, it goes like this. The calcification of your arteries is more real than the taste of that fried chicken. That's what he's saying. He's saying that's more real. He's saying, so you go ahead and think all you want. You're getting away with something because it felt good right now. It tastes good right now. He said, let me tell you something. That insulin needle is more real than that, that, that sweet stuff you eat. So go ahead, if you want, live this temporary lifestyle. So he says, confession is this issue of, of this is just me. I'm just trying to help us grab a hold of what it's going to take to get past this moment. He's saying, recognize that the natural stuff is more real. It's more real. I mean, the spiritual stuff is more real than the natural stuff. Y'all following me? All right, all right. Now, after I've done that, go ahead and formulate your confession. Lord, your word says in Ephesians chapter 5, I need to stop doing what I'm doing. Call it out, so I need to stop. And I recognize if I don't, it's going to be hard for me to prove that I can keep sinning over and over again and I'm still saved. So God, this is, I'm making a personal confession and then keep, keep speaking that thing over your life. Keep, keep keeping myself away from temptation until I live that thing out. Man, I, this got to be helping somebody. It has to be. And, 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 and so, and so he, he says, the issue is, I understand you have moments of struggle and temptation and moments of failure. He's saying the issue for me is your lack of sorrow over your impurity. That, the issue for me is your lack of sorrow over your greed, over your covetousness. My, he says, what is bothering me is your justification of your mess. Well, I'm cheating on my husband because God wants me happy. No, don't do that, he says. No, he says, no, don't be sorrowful when you get it wrong, is what he's saying. He, so, so I hope y'all here, I hope y'all out there listening because my, my, my studio crowd not helping me. So what he says is, he says, don't be partners with that stuff. Verse 7, do not become, everybody say, do not become a partner. Do, listen, the stuff that's, you know, my undergrad is, degree is in biochemistry. You could take a grain of iodine and it will give color to 7,000 times its own weight in water. So he's saying, you don't have to do it a lot. Just a little bit of it, wow. but I feel the Holy Ghost, yeah. can discolor you. Wow. Just a little bit. Where, where, where nobody cares how good you can sing because you've discolored it and discredited yourself. Nobody cares how faithful you are because you've discovered and discredited yourself. How in the world are you going to lead the prostitute from the temple of Diana to Christ when you just slept with her after you got saved. <sighs> he, he says, listen, he says, listen, what, what, all, all I've tried to teach y'all is how we renounce evil, right? So the, all of that was on the first big category about our standard of love. Y'all still with me in the handout, right? Now, I'll end on here, I'll end here. The second big category of our standard of love is our standard of light, our standard of light. Verse 8, let me, let me spend some time here now. For at one time you were, and this blew my mind when I read this and I was studying this in, in the Greek. He says, not, he, he doesn't say you were in darkness, he says you were darkness. Wow. He says, at one time, I lost my place, verse 8, here we go. 
at one time you were darkness. Well, so what he's saying to them is stop being dark. This is what he's saying. When you're dark, you create stumbling blocks for unsaved people. So they're stumbling over your lifestyle. He says the issue with people is not me, it's you. So he's saying you've created stumbling. He says you are darkness. They're trying to find their way, and you keep them in darkness. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the world. Walk as children of light. So, so let's talk about this for a moment, y'all. Just, God, I got... I got so much I want to teach. This is what he's saying. He's saying, put on Christ. Let, 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 me, let, me, let me make it live for a minute. You were darkness, but I want you, he says, to walk as children of light. At one time you were darkness, but now you are light. How do I become light? I want you to get this. I become light by walking in the light. Let me read it one more time because I don't want us to miss it. Verse 8. At one time you were darkness, but now you are light. Wait, wait a minute. How do I go from darkness to light, God? Walking as children of light. So as I walk as a child of light, I become light. Are y'all hearing me? Now watch this. Let me, let, me, let, me, let me make a lift for you. Let me make a lift for you. There's this man that is born with major deformity in his face. Major deformity in his face. He is the ridicule of the community. He's from a little community, little town, size of pine tops. He grows up going through school because of this severe deformity, alone and lonely. He becomes a man and he decides, you know what, can't live here no more. I'm just going to move away, start my life over, and I'll just do the best I can. He gets to the big city. When he arrives, he finds this amazing, beautiful mask. He puts the mask on. At first, the mask was uncomfortable. But day by day, he gets more comfortable with wearing the mask. He becomes more comfortable with wearing the mask, and he starts making friends. He, he starts becoming popular. Things get so good, he asks a woman to marry him. She says yes. As they're preparing for the town, nuptials in town, a person from his old Pine Tops community shows up where he's living in Charlotte. Some kind of way, she figured out his identity. In a moment of shame and embarrassment in front of his fiance and all the crowd, she walks up to him and says, that's not who you are. Take off your mask. In a moment of shame, he takes off the mask. And much to his surprise, his face now looked like the mask. Because he conformed to what he was trying to be. That's what God is saying. I know at first... Not taking the easy way is hard. Not, not you used to, you know, sleeping around is hard. You used to having friends because you gossip is hard. You used to just not saying anything in front of the crowd in order to have friends. It's hard not to do that. But he says, if you start walking in the light, you're going to look up and you're going to recognize you are light. And that's what he's saying. He's saying that now we have to have this standard of light, this standard of light. So what does this standard of light look like? First of all, it looks like my character. T type in, jot down my character. I'm going to end here because I'm out of time. And I want to make sure when we come back in the room, I'm honoring people's time to get back to work. So let me just say this, and I'm done when I, say, when I teach on character. So he's saying, I need to become a child of light. He's saying that, that verse 8, um, I was in darkness, but now I'm light of the world. He's saying, walk, that's my character, as a child of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good. Look at this. Here's my character, good and right and true. This is my standard of light in my character. Let me, 
When I say character, I'm talking about in my level of commitment. When I say I'm going to do something and I don't, it is a blemish on my character. When I say that I'm going to be on time and I'm late, it is a blemish on my character. It, he's speaking about our integrity as believers. He's speaking about how disciplined we are as believers. He's th speaking about how we serve and the attitude in which we do it and the sacrifice in which we make. He, he's saying this standard of light is a standard of a character that comes in Christ. And, and I've learned in my own life, y'all, when we begin living out in character of Christ, that character is what gives you a platform. It's not, it's not, <laughs> let me tell you something, man. I know so many people that got opportunity not because they had the best skill set, but because they had the best character. I look, I'd much rather, I'd much rather work with somebody that I need to teach them a job. I can teach you the job, but I can't teach you not to steal from me. Amen. I mean, it's just the truth of the matter. The character is what's going to give you. Now, I want you to get the context. I'm, I'm, I, gotta be, I have to be done. He's trying to reach them so they can reach Ephesus. The same way I want us to reach our, our state and our nation. So he's saying part of what is going to help us reach people is us as Christians having character. Some of you have heard me talk about this. When we first arrived here, church was, I don't know, eight, ten months old. I really can't remember. And uh, in the beginning days, we used to print all of our worship bulletins out on my home printer. We printed all of our envelopes out in the home printer. We designed them. That, the, the design of our envelopes is the design we have had from the very beginning that, that I designed and we used to print out at home. And we would sit on the floor, man, Saturday nights and fold the bulletin and print them out and had to buy some cartridges. And we realized, man, we need a copier, right? We need a, we need a, we need a machine to do this work. And, and a copier company came in and they said, Pastor, I can't, can't do business with you. I'm like, what do you mean I can't, can't do business with us? He said that my, my company has a policy not to lease to churches. And I said that, well, why? He said, because churches don't pay us. And I said, but that, that might have nothing to do with us. She said, I know, I know that's not right. And they wound up figuring it out for us. She put herself on line. She said, if I, this don't work out, I'm coming to get you. You know, 16 years later, we still do business with them. We don't lease them now. We just buy the copiers. Your character matters. Your character is what's going to create a platform. Your character is what makes people look at you and say, would you be my role model? Would you be my mentor? Your, your character is what creates attraction where people are like, I want to be connected to you. And so what Paul is saying to the church at Ephesus and what I'm trying to say to us and I'm done is that we ought allow our standard of light to be such that people are like, oh, your character, you must be one of them. You must be one of God's people. You must, you know, when we first did our first phase of the building, we were waiting for loan money to come in and we hadn't raised enough money and um, the general contractor that we wound up working with on that first phase before we started doing our own project management and everything came to me, he said, he said, you look like we had already identified the contract and we're just waiting for the money, we had the money. This is what he said to me. You look like a man that if I shake his hand, he's going to do what he says he's going to do. I said, yes, sir, I'm that kind of man. He extended his hand. I shook his hand. He said, with your permission, I'd like to get started on Monday. I have a funny feeling you're going to make sure we get paid eventually. We, they wound up doing $850,000 worth of work before we gave them a penny. But we paid them. Character matters. And so, would you take time this, this week and would you reflect on your conduct? That's all today's Bible study was about, reflecting on my conduct. Keep this sheet for next week. I have a lot more teaching to do. I think the best part is still in front of us. Thanks for listening to Orthos. I hope you enjoyed today's Bible study. If you've got questions or comments or feedback, I'd love for you to share it with me. You can email me at james at 
jamesgalliard.com. I would also encourage you to follow me on one of my social media outlets. Go ahead and subscribe, either at Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or Instagram. Again, thanks for listening.